Okay, so uh, so not to contradict uh, Tish, but you don't owe me a thing. <laughs> I enjoyed uh, everything I did uh, in my career and still am enjoying it. I didn't invent computing. But I think from the standpoint of what it means to uh, be professionals, what it means to love our field and its potential, uh, we owe it to the world to do a lot better than what has been happening, uh, many things that have been happening over the last 30 or 40 years or so. And I thought, uh, since I won't be there for the entire meeting, that uh, perhaps what I could do is to look at uh, some of the heuristics for doing the kinds of invention and design going forward. Uh, many of these uh, were ones that I learned when I was in the ARPA and PARC communities. Uh, and uh, the nice thing about the larger scale heuristics is they tend to apply in lots of uh, different areas. Uh, so the first heuristic, of course, is used heuristics. And many of us, let's see a show of hands there, how many people uh, use this book when they were students? Hmm. Okay, so this is a book from a different era. This is the particular one. This, this, this book has sold uh, several millions of copies, which is pretty amazing for a book about how to uh, deal with mathematical problems by George Polia. And I knew him towards the end of his life uh, when he was at Stanford. But long before that, this book appeared, I think, in the 40s and started selling and being reprinted. Everybody who did use it will have a particular cover they remember. This is the one I remember from 1957. And if uh, Polio were around today, we would try to get him to write a new book, which is called How to Find It. Because finding the best problems to work on, particularly in an era where there's a lot of fadism and a lot of hurting going on, particularly amongst funders. Uh, find, being able to identify finding problems that are perhaps a little bit out of the normal is one of the most critical skills to develop. And it's very much a heuristic skill. And we got, I think we tried to get Holy to write a book on how to make it because things uh, more and more have to be made with heuristics rather than uh, uh, much solider uh, algorithms. And of course, if you're going to flesh this out, you want a book called How to Anything Yet. <laughs> I, I mention this because uh, of our limited brain, or at least my limited brain, uh, I've been using a technique for many years that I got from Covington and Crutchfield, who were psychologists at Berkeley, which is to use uh, the visual field around us uh, to augment our seven plus or minus two or worse uh, ability to deal with chunking. And so even though most of these heuristics, I think, are going to be familiar with you. I'm using it as a kind of a refresher. Uh, it's very, very useful to have them out in front, because then it frees up brain cells for doing the actual design work. And so here's a, my original plan for this talk is I wrote down a bunch of general heuristics for doing design and thinking and inventing and stuff. And Actually, many more of these, but these are the ones that fitted here. My plan was to expand a few of these, and especially to 
uh, concentrated in this talk on one of these heuristics, which is called 10 things. And the 10 things heuristic is whenever you're tr trying to do anything, uh, you don't want to put labels on it. Instead, you want to write down 10 things that are that most characterize what it is that you're trying to do. And this is especially the case when you're trying to do something large in general, like a platform or a programming language. Uh, and in fact, what, what happened is I got entranced by uh, a different heuristic, uh, the Martin Minsky one, you don't understand something if you only understand it one way. So the heuristic is you should try and always try and understand things more than one way. And I flushed out some of these general heuristics at the expense of my 10 things. So I only treated a few of the 10 things uh, towards the end of this end of this talk. And here's something that we know that it's the simplest use of heuristics uh, in problem and goal uh, solving. And what Polia's book is mainly about is some of the heuristics miss, some of them hit part of the thing. Eventually you can cover the problem that you're working on and that might allow you to find a more elegant solution, but the heuristics are what get you to uh, understanding uh, this particular goal you set for yourself. But a much bigger idea is this idea that heuristics can come from making. And those of you who are familiar with the way PCB IP actually works will know that it is actually not algorithmic, but a collection of uh, six to eight heuristics that deal with all the various problems. And to get to those heuristics, uh, guarantee that eventually uh, a packet will get through. These, of course, are simpler on the Ethernet. But this is a big idea. When we were working on the Internet and Ethernet a long time ago, uh, in the 70s, uh, this idea came up that, wow, there's, a, there's kind of a new mathematics lurking somehow uh, that should tell us how to organize covering heuristics. So new heuristics can be added and old heuristics can be taken out. And the covering we get from those should somehow be figured out by the mathematics, not just empirically. Uh, as far as I know, this is something that's yet to be worked on. Uh, during the period of expert systems, it was worked on quite a bit, but then expert systems got done away with in terms of working on the simpler problems of doing machine learning. Then the big deal, as I mentioned, is problem finding. And here it's a much more laborious uh, process, similar to the others, except that you don't know what the problem is. You don't know what the goal is that you're looking for. And that brings up another heuristic, which is that most ideas are mediocre down to bad. So this is a really good one to always have in mind. Uh, because as human beings, we tend to be so gratified and happy when we have any kind of idea. We start acting as though it might be a good idea. Whereas in fact, 99 out of 100 ideas are at best mediocre, and most of them are really bad. So we have to have something to do with all those ideas, because we have to let them happen. And the bigger heuristic here is don't leap into problem solving, even though that's what you were taught in school, until you work to find the great problem. This was the key to the research community, the ARPA part research community I was in. They almost never worked on problems that were easy to solve. And so they were going against an entire lifetime of being in a regular human society, and especially regular human schools, where the idea is to get the A. And if you think about it, getting an A means you're working on fairly easy problems. Most of them have been solved before. And you're basically uh, limiting yourself by staying away from the ones 
where uh, the work you would hand in is work in progress. I was very lucky when I got my PhD, the head of uh, the computer science department at Utah in the 60s, David Evans, uh, said, well, if you're working on a medium-sized problem, you should finish it. But if you're working on a really big problem, uh, just write up two years of world-class work, and I'll sign it. Because he realized you can't uh, solve huge problems in just a couple of years, and he didn't want people to stay in grad school forever. And so he allowed his graduate students to work on enormous problems. My, mine was personal computing, uh, and of course I didn't get done. I've been working on it for the rest of my life. And this piecing together the problem is a bit like the problem of the elephant, which we all know about. All of the blind philosophers here have their own opinions, and for most people that leads to war, kind of like the opinion wars that we have right now, and people will not give up their opinions, and so when a compromise is made, it's usually made by pa uh, pasting together the opinions. And I think we can all agree that a lot of the software and general systems today have that uh, appearance of just being uh, pasted up stuff without a lot of overall design or a lot of thinking about what things should be. But the methods of science allow uh, scientists to figure out what the Earth would look like from space uh, in the 17th and 18th centuries, to the point that when we went out there uh, and looked back and took a picture of the Earth that looked just like the globes that uh, the, had been figured out by putting together evidence and cooperating on measurements and all of that stuff. So these blind philosophers can figure out that this is a good thing. Uh, but still, maybe there's more. I just love this cartoon. I had it a few years ago, and then I lost it. I couldn't find it again. And it, it finally turned up. And the deity here says, well, no, not exactly. Not exactly, no. And so this is, I think, the essence of where design is importantly different from doing science and engineering. It overlaps in many ways. But in fact, design is in large part about the not exactly part. And there was a great Japanese poet in the 17th century that had perhaps a simpler way of thinking about this. And this is, uh, Masahide, who said in one of his uh, poems, the barn burnt down, but now I can see the moon. I just love that. Because we are so attached to the stuff that we've got, we would feel lost if the barn burnt down, but he realized, oh, I, uh, the moon is much uh, better for me to contemplate and think about than the barn was. I wish I could do both at the same time. And so this gives us some more uh, heuristics because one of the ways of thinking about the now is it's so vivid. It's so full of uh, what appears to be reality. And it has a very defined past. It is so vivid and so distracting, it's very hard to think about anything else. And so most of the stuff that people do when they try to make an improvement is just an incremental improvement. The genre isn't changed. It's something that assumes some uh, false idea, like the idea that Darwinian processes optimize. And of course they don't. Darwinian processes just fit match up to environments. If you have a stupid environment, you're going to wind up with stupid matchups. And so if you do this <coughs> barn burning idea and get to see the moon, so now it's dark. And by moonlight, you can start seeing other parts of the past. 
parts of the past that didn't fit into the stream that got us to now, but were nonetheless interesting and important, and maybe a couple of parts in the, in the past that are critical. And this movement represents an idea that's not stemming from the now. It's somehow finding a way of escaping from the present and the past that led to it. And then this idea and the ideas that help us think about it give us the opportunity to live in this future. And we have to do that in order to invent it. This is kind of paradoxical. Because we have to build this future in order to live in it, in order to invent it. And so this idea is you have to somehow get a beachhead out there. You have to start building. And you have to build in that context. And that context will help you understand what to build. This is what the ARCA part process was actually about. And think about it. One of the implications here is, if it's about computing, you better not build this future using computers today. Because computers today represent not just the present, but the past. And so you have to be very, very careful about how much you think you're going to save by using current day hardware. Uh, the ARPA Park community uh, built all of its hardware and software. This was a serious group, and they were seriously about a real future. And so they were able to bypass uh, vendors almost entirely at the expense of having to do all this work themselves, but it paid off in a, in a big way. Well, so ideas are hard, as we said. One of the reasons they're hard is we act as though they're built from uh, impenetrable matter. Categories are distinct. That's the whole point. Words are supposed to be different from other words. And, but if ideas are made from life, or processes, or relationships, you have superposition. And superposition allows us to look at many ideas at the same time and combinations of them without having them fight each other. And the moon lurks in there. It's not in the other diagram. And since we like t-shirts in Silicon Valley, here's a perfect t-shirt for this session today. We all uh, thought about that. Uh, the idea is what, what are the really powerful ideas and how do they combine and play off against each other? So the big idea here is categories are useful as shortcuts, but they aren't realities. They only represent limited points of view, the stovepipes. So we come back to our deity here. We realize we better avoid words, because once we say this thing is an elephant, We've made it very difficult to think about all the things that we were actually dealing with. We've short-circuited the description in favor of a label. And we are all too prone towards now thinking about things in terms of whatever we think is attached to that label instead of thinking about the thing itself. And so we can look at the title of this conference. And Wow, to me there are a lot of uh, labels in here, and most of them are way too specific for having any kind of discussion here. So these guys are particularly troublesome. Uh, so if we get rid of those, maybe let computing show through the future of computing. Uh, no. How about the future conference? <laughs> that way you can think about what you really need, and then the computer comes along and can help. That might be a good way. Of course, I have a prejudice towards thinking about personal computing and stuff, but I think saying personal computer, uh, I think in most people's minds, is thinking about what that means today. And 
especially uh, what, what this means. And I think this is a very bad idea. So uh, let's just get rid of those. The future conference. Now a better title was in Licklider's first paper, uh, Human Computer Symbiosis. That's less specific, but Engelbart quite correctly said, no, we, we don't want to mention computer and symbiosis here. What we're really about is augmenting human intellect. And, but he, if you read his first uh, document about this, he spends a fair amount of time talking about how part of this augmentation system is going to be an AI that helps. And so what he really should have said was an aug augmenting intellect because uh, this is the very thing that machine, machine learning doesn't have today. It isn't an intellect. It desperately needs to be augmented. We shouldn't use it until it is augmented. And augmenting has a slight tinge of improvement, but to me it's not strong enough. So I've replaced this with the, a good goal is improving intellect. And we have to include our tools because our tools are starting to get more cognitive. So that heuristic again. This stuff is, seems nitpicking, but it's really important because once you set your context, the context disappears, and then it's all about trying to win or trying to make something happen in the goals that those, that contract, uh, context sets up. So, good start to find great problems is the first line of great vision. And again, these are hard to come by. So here's a curve in time. When it goes up, we're happy. When it goes down, we're unhappy, uh, and so forth. This could be reading scores in the US. You see this in the papers over many, many years. The problem is uh, they're never done relative to anything. So it's hard to understand, what does this mean? We're getting better in reading, we're getting not better. You put a, a threshold in there. The threshold for reading is fluent, the kid can fluently read. This is not happening with most children. And most adults can't fluently read. And so it doesn't matter whether this thing is going up or down. That, that threshold, what is, the threshold is called what is actually needed. That tells us whether we're just bullshitting around or whether we're actually accomplishing something. And so we can see this heuristic is that better and perfect are the enemies of what is actually needed. We have to hone in on what's actually needed. And I'm going to use the moon here as a symbol of that. We have to shoot for the thing that's most doable that is barely above this threshold. So instead of being in the pink, we're in the sky here. And that allows the stuff that we do from then on, this is our beachhead, to be of this new stuff that's above what is actually needed. Not uh, desperate uh, attempts to do incremental improvements on stuff that isn't very good. One of the biggest problems here, particularly for funders, is that learning curves to get there often go away even from what is working in uh, the inadequate context. It's very hard for funders to fund things where you have to, your initial artifacts are worse than the things you're trying to do much better than. I like to use uh, bicycles. Typical American bike for kids has chain wheels on it. And the theory to common sense is, oh, this will help the child uh, keep the bike upright and stuff. But if you think about it, it, it's exactly the opposite. The training wheels prevent the kid from practicing the very thing you need to learn to ride a bike, which is to be able to balance and lean into the turns. So the uh, threshold here is uh, a kind of bike that is just starting to appear more and more as people realize how bad 
the, the training wheels idea is. So this is called a balance bike. And it's low to the ground. It doesn't have any pedals. So it's kind of a scooter, but it's a scooter in which the kid learns how to steer. And because it's low to the ground, the kid can catch it from falling over. And so the kid winds up spending most of its time uh, learning how to balance. And this is an important thing for our uh, uh, symposium today. And that is because most optimizations tend to be incremental on what's presented to the optimizer. <coughs> this is not a made up picture. There are actually societies in the United States of people who grew up on training wheels and went to better and better bikes, never learned how to ride a bike. And so now they have these very fancy bikes and they held bike races and rallies and everything. The training wheels remain on. But that isn't, isn't like most of the computer systems uh, today for both consumers, especially and for professionals. I don't know what it is. Whereas if, if you start up in this qualitatively better area, you're going to get qualitatively better uh, uh, improvements when you optimize. And of course, we should do that to the title of this conference. And here's a heuristic, which is just take anything, any set of sentences like the ones I'm saying, or the, the titles of talks that we have today, or anything. All we started off in this below threshold area. Just say, rule of thumb, it's below threshold. I don't care what it is. Then ask what is actually needed and what is, what is the threshold we have to get past. Now, one of the heuristics that's tough here is the one is that this is not just about computing or technology per se. I think the larger context is that we're dealing with people in many, many different ways. And this is a toughie for technologists. Because most technologists got into technology because they were uncomfortable being around people. They liked machinery better. And, but yes, yes, Mr. Spock. And here's the Humans 101 heuristic. Hamlet means seven plus or minus two, means multiple minded, means system one, means culture. These are the cliff notes for getting through what is really a year long or a two year long course in anthropology. And the way it goes is our minds are like theaters. And they're very tiny theaters, really tiny. And we have different kinds of theaters. So we have a theater for our gestures and touch. We have a theater that's all about things we can see and configure. That theater deals with sound also. We have a theater for the symbols that we make up. We have many other theaters also. I'm just mentioning three here. System one is about all the parts of our brain that are set up for being able to do things quickly. And we share these parts of our brain with most mammals, and especially with primates. Most of our mind is not human. And we are creatures of culture. And so in this play that we're acting out in the theaters of our mind, we become that play. The play that we're born into is the play that winds up defining us. It's not reality. It's just a play. And so this gives us a set of heuristics to, that we have to understand. Whatever we think we are, we're more theatrical than we assume. Our minds are much smaller than we assume. Our multiple mentalities are much more separate than we think they are. We're much more non-human than we assume. And we're much more culturally shaped than we think. And we just, this is a very large area, and I'm not going to go into it further. I'll just point out these three mentalities, which were identified by Jerome Brunner in the 60s, working off ideas by Piaget, and particularly the symbolic mentality, 
are the ones that uh, important psychological theories can be built on. And the user interfaces we still use today were built using this psychological model, plus some of the theatrical ideas that I've mentioned. So user interface is part of understanding how humans go about doing things. For example, our visual mentality is can be aware of about 100 things at once. And what it means is we should, if we're trying to uh, help people understand or we're trying to uh, get a sense of what's going on, we should flood the visual field with about 100 things. We can uh, pay attention to them. But we can only think about 7 plus or minus 2, really more like 4 plus or minus 3 at once. The visual field allows us to pay attention to a whole bunch of things. And what we can think about is much less. And so these two ideas have to be played off against each other, regardless of the kind of design we do. It doesn't have to be about computers or user interface or anything. And of course, one of the heuristics for doing this stuff is find unusual people. The good news is that these are easy in the sense that each generation, way up on the bell curve, uh, there will be a few hundreds out of a few hundreds of millions of people of really unusual people. So if it's pro football, get Brady. If it's Xerox Park, get Butler. And if you need one in a million, there's going to be 200 of them. If you need one in 10 million, there'll be 20. Uh, having worked with Butler over many years, I would say he was rare, more rare than Don Brady. But uh, Butler isn't the only uh, Butler around. Uh, but you need a couple of them if you're going to be successful. An important side heuristic is to make your organization, even if it's a small organization, also part of the process to create these special people. You find the potential just as you do in your problems and just as you do in the technical solutions you're starting to come up with. You have to find the potential in people. You have to build them into researchers. And this is uh, crucial because uh, the, all of the PhDs in computing at Xerox Park were created by the ARPA research community as part of their research. And here are the four guys who did ARPA, IBEO, Information Processing Techniques, Licklider, Sutherland, Bob Taylor, and Larry Roberts. And in their interviews, uh, Lick said, well, I was just trying to get the best people I could find who are interested in this area. And I even said, the people you want to get also want to choose their own problems and methods. That's a problem. Bob Taylor said, my job is to organize things so when the lone wolves need to cooperate, they will. That's a real thing. That was the secret of success to a lot of things that happened in art and also throughout its part. And Larry Roberts pointed out that ARPA projects are one of the best sources for new ARPA researchers. Uh, let's keep on doing that. And of course, there's this problem. What are these people like? And some people think they're like this. This man right here is my great-grandfather. He's the first cat herder in our family. Well, the problem is only cats can do this stuff. And this way of looking at command and control, which most adults, like those cowboys, are used to, and the cowboys we have in Washington, 
and a lot of the other kinds of cowboys we have around, they just don't understand anything that isn't like command and control. That just doesn't work with cats. So I looked on the internet for uh, some people who can get cats to do uh, what they want, and here's a brother and sister, 12 years old and 11 years old, who solved this problem. some feel for what cats like and, and want to do. The ultimate cat toy is a great vision. And here's one of the greatest ones, one I still uh, would put in my 10 things about what should come next. And here is using words in a very special way. Computers are destined to become interactive intellectual amplifiers for everyone universally networked worldwide. He doesn't say how, doesn't say what an intellectual amplifier is, uh, he doesn't say how to do the network. So this is a great uh, vision, and what a great vision does, and it acts like a magnet over the horizon. This vision just sits there and it lines up all of us iron particles. You don't have to communicate sideways at first, we all have our own way of getting to north here. That's what a great vision is. And so the ultimate heuristic here is that the goodness of the results correlates most strongly with the goodness of the funders. If you don't have great funders, eventually it's going to come a proper because research means you can change your mind. It's the most important thing to understand, the difference between Research, real research and engineering. Engineering, you have uh, a much more crisper set of objectives, but in research, you're finding out things all the time. And uh, often you find out that what you were looking for isn't the thing you should be looking for. Well, how do we get the great visions? And I think this is where uh, most of today's computer people fall way down. Because they're really just looking for uh, things they can sell to American consumers. A lot of these are the technological equivalent of sugar water. Or they might be simple aids, uh, things that can be sold into business and so forth. And I just don't think uh, you're going to get a great vision out of this. Uh, but I think you can look at it. For example, the intertwined systems of some of the grave human challenges of our time. So here's uh, maybe 12 of them, and there are more, and they're related. So if you pick a few of these that you particularly have emotional feelings about, these are half the moon in them. You can get a really great vision from these, and we need to, because as Einstein pointed out, we cannot solve our problems with the same levels of thinking that we used to create them. We have to get out of the levels of thinking. You have to do it to get a future that's not just incrementally derived from the present, but we also have to do it because we're messing up ourselves and our planet. So I'm going to skip this one. And I'm going to skip this one because these are uh, some of the heuristics used by these uh, great research leaders. And not all of them are from these four guys, but they represent uh, 
a list I made a couple of years ago about the main principles that this Arca Park community uh, rode on. So maybe these are the, the important ones. But now if we come back to the original plan for the talk. Uh, so looking at 10 things here, I've really got time just to talk about a few of them. And I've already talked about destiny. That's, I would just take Licklider's notion of the destiny of computing are to become uh, interactive intellectual amplifiers for basically network worldwide. Leave it with that, that's good enough for me. That would be one of my 10 things. Now for dimensions, there are more dimensions than three here. And of course, if we had uh, David's goggles, we could, uh, or uh, in some of Ken Berlin's software, we could take a step at higher order dimensions. But if we take three, uh, we have to span all the communications modes. We, one, one of these is between uh, a human and a human, and between a group of people and a person, between a group of people and a group of people, and so forth. So all of those combinations of people trying to find something common in their thought cloud, because that's what communication is. And usually that question mark has to be negotiated. So whatever communication modes are, notice we've got a terrible setup right here, because uh, I'm having to guess what's in your thought cloud to point at stuff. You can't negotiate with me. Uh, we'll have some questions and answers after. So this is a really weak way of doing it. Something that uh, we worked on in op doing operating systems, uh, programming languages, and the internet is hardware and software, singly and together, uh, finding common ground and having common ground set up there. A really interesting one is the user interface problem, which is what is the common ground between humans and mechanisms. And one that you have to throw in there for completeness is all of these are about humans communicating with aliens. And I think in order to widen it out enough, you should throw in thoughts about real aliens here because they'll help everything else. So age is a... You, the, the thing that got my career going was after meeting Seymour Packard and realizing computing was much more important than just an adult tool. It's actually as important as the printing press, and therefore it had to be extended into the world of children. And you had to solve all of these problems for children, and all the way up to old people like me, and everybody in between. And then for expertise, we have the situation today where some children are more expert than some of the old codgers. Now for Engelbart 101, I can't do justice to it, so I'm gonna take just one idea that I think is absolutely critical, uh, as critical or more critical today as it was back then. And we're all familiar with this. We're familiar with it because this is what we're doing right now, maybe. Except for the fact that that system that they're working on uh, is at the operating system level, allows uh, sharing amongst any number of people. This is this picture of them having a meeting using this system. They're not just looking at stuff. Everybody has their own cursors. The cursors are independent. Things can be worked on separately. So it's, even though the screens were small back then, their ideas were big. So the way they thought of this is everybody was in the same world. And to me, it's completely pathetic that 51 years after this demo, I don't know of a single operating system today in computing that uh, has this general facility of being able to share interaction on anything. 
that is done in that operating system. This is completely pathetic. The last chance people had to do something were perhaps the operating systems, uh, the iOS operating systems or Android. But in fact, the web browser people had a chance to do it because if they realized it was an operating system and not an application, then they could have thought about what, what should an op what are the ten things an operating system should do. But there's more to this. There's how do you think about what this augmentation is? Well, one is by a tool, and a tool is affecting outwards, like this little girl with the hammer. The tool affects back. For one thing, it helps us get better at whatever we're doing, she gets better at hammer. But it also actually gives us a hammer idea. It builds a little hammer brain. So when she's an adult, maybe a secretary of state or something, she might think of hammering somebody with a nuclear weapon to solve a problem. Uh, people today are thinking about using AI as a hammer to solve problems. Hammering things usually doesn't work that well, except in limited range. But the problem is that the tools that don't teach us very well. The tools teach us very limited versions of themselves. But there's another kind of tool, and that is a tool that builds inward. So this little girl is facilitating inner growth by uh, reading a book here, learning ideas she doesn't have having multiple ways of looking at things. You can get help by an agent. Here's the kid's parents. And the agent has the problem that the more we use agents, the less we learn how to do ourselves. You have to be very careful with agents. And the problem is everybody likes servants. But here's a teacher facilitating internal growth, not playing the violin for the kid, but helping the kid learn how to play the violin. We can affect outward through teaming. But we can also set up activities that build us internally through teaming. So the Engelbart people thought about all of these modes way back in the 60s. And they also thought about what if you replaced some of these elements with AIs. And that brings up a whole bunch of other problems, some of them providing great use and some of them uh, uh, providing uh, a way of preventing thinking. So if we combine those ideas they were thinking about and look at them at their meeting, we can see this thing that we have today. Because every system today is pretty much just giving people a simple tool. And as Thoreau said, we become the tools of our tools. What the Engelbart people call for is no. We have to have explicit education, not casual edu education, but explicit education to deal with these huge gaps between the limited uh, things our brains can do and the immense power, power of factors of millions over what we had 100,000 years ago. And with that, we're a, a little bit more safe to use improved methods and improved ways of representing things. And that gives us a unit. This five-component uh, system is an augmented human in the way Engelbart thought about it. And similarly, when you put a group together, you're putting augmented humans together into a group of augmented humans to boost their collective IQ. This is what Engelbart actually meant by this. So I don't think you could admit doing this. This just hasn't been done. It was completely ignored or forgotten or not even seen in the last 50 years uh, since Engelbart, especially the last 40 years of commercialization. This is a non-optional thing. And just in passing, uh, because uh, Webb was mentioned there, here's one of the great lost opportunities in personal computing history, the inability of World Wide Web people and the browser people to look at HyperCard to understand what it was and what it would mean to uh, the experience. This is a tragedy.
because four million people, separate people, created scripted stacks and apps. And Hypercard appeared about five years before the World Wide Web. So this is something to ponder on. It's not too late to do it. it has, something like this has to be done in the next system. It won't look like Hypercard, but it has to be able to do the brilliant things in user interface that Hypercard is able to accomplish. OK, let's take a look now at uh, one of the modern day Amberbarks, Brett Victor. Uh, Brett is large. I've gotten so many ideas from him. Uh, this thing that you're looking at is a big poster. It's about five feet by eight feet, done at high resolution. And it's hard to see what the poster is about here because uh, part of the reason he did it as a poster and printed it on a high res printer was to make the point that uh, the screens we're looking at and we've gotten used to are much, much too small for doing any kind of serious thinking. Uh, and in fact, in order to look at any part of the poster, like this part, to see what it is, we have to blow it up to screen size. Oh yeah, so this is a mass of situation for him, and he's making the point that if you're doing something complicated like a space flight, uh, you have to pay attention to everything that's going on. You have to have people paying attention, machines paying attention. You have to have processes that are combining various kinds of visualizations and ways of affecting things and, and so forth. And here, the, the, a room like this is asking questions like, where are we? What's been happening? What just happened? What's about to happen? What can we do? And so forth. But we can see that on this poster, as put on our tiny little computer screen here, you can't see what it is. And what that means is anything you're looking at on a computer screen is not showing you enough. It's not showing you what you want to look at. But remember our visual field, being able to pay attention to 100 things. We have to show all of those other things also. Here's a power grid room, very similar. But if you look at a business decision room, or worse, the White House situation room, they've got a technology that looks like, I'm sure I can even see pencils, but I can see paper. They've got coffee cups. They're talking about things uh, the way gay people would be on fire. And in these situations, the answers to these questions are trivial and upsetting. Because there's a lot of power behind both of these runs, and yet the processes for understanding what's going on and deciding what to do are terrible. Uh, Here's a shot of the room that you're in right now. And let me point out that it is very darn close to those terrible business decision rooms. This room at the Computer History Museum was built as, as a meeting room, right, Pish? Yes, yes. It's not a meeting room. No, learning app. Sorry, this is the learning app. Right. So we go to another modern day angle of art. Uh, Dave Smith here, a thing he did for Lockheed is really interesting, which is to take something that is familiar, at least look, be able to look at each other's faces, and then the idea is to manifest the hundred things that are germane to what's being talked about and being able to isolate the ones that you particularly want to discuss at any particular time, and isolate them as a kind of, uh, manifest them as a kind of an apparition that appears. This was that David did this with glasses. It will eventually probably be done with glasses. Uh, good enough glasses actually happen. 
But the basic idea here that humans are cultural, humans are social, humans do things together, humans need to be augmented, humans need to understand what's going on, humans need to play with things. All of these things here are wrapped up in this image. And of course, Brett acted on his three or four years of thinking by making a system out in the air, which is called dynamic land. And so there are projectors everywhere and uh, video cameras. And so the video cameras are picking up what's going on in the physical world. And computer programs are making, a, making models that fit into the physical world, but are also uh, in the computer world, and they're superposed on this world. This I, the first time I ever saw this idea was from Nicholas Negroponte in the early 70s, when he pointed out that uh, not too far in the future, the entire world is going to have displays on everything. There will be displays <coughs> on uh, cans, cans of tomato soup in the supermarket. And it's all going to be networked by the, by the internet. And so there's a really interesting problem of what, what does it mean uh, when you're actually living inside the computer. And this, this system is really worthwhile visiting. It's really worthwhile supporting if you're a funder. Uh, there are many more good ideas here than we've seen in decades. Now here's a good one to end one. Maybe the second heuristic to uh, the goodness of the result correlates most strongly with the goodness of the funders. And that's Picasso's. Learn the rules like a pro so you can break them like an artist. Now go play. <laughs>